thousands in what is probably the most dangerous sport in the world. He's certainly dressed up for it, but it's all very necessary. The padded leather suit protects his body from a too hurried contact with Mother Earth, sometimes under a couple of hundred pounds of motorcycle. The crash helmet acts as a kind of a buffer between the rider's head and the track in the event of a spill. Oddly enough, eye shields and anti gas make ideal speedway goggles. They're light and give a wide range of vision. Now what's he looking for? Oh, the metal ski. This fits onto the sole of his left boot, which spends more time in the track than on the machine, especially when broadsiding. The smooth metal surface enables the rider to slide his foot along the track, taking some of his weight off the machine. The handkerchief or scarf protects the face. Flying cinders from the track play havoc with the complexion. It sounds as if they're racing, so let's go out onto the track. They're off, neck and neck into the first bed. Here's something of the tournament spirit of the Middle Ages. Modern gladiators risking life and live in the heat of combat. Broad sliding round the bend at terrific speed. Too close together, but one mistake might prove fatal. these men who seem to defy even the laws of gravity. Men like Vic Duggan, Australian champion, probably the world's finest writer. Will Belamero, the mighty Adam from America. Jack Parker, captain of England and Bellevue, and his brother Norman, who also rides for England and is captain of Wimbledon. The ever-popular veteran Max Crossgroup. Or Broughton, the young and spectacular rider from Australia. And Lionel Van Pratt, the only world champion riding today. He's ridden in more than 5,000 races and is still at the top of his form. Coincidentally, Van supervised the production of this film. Now, let's look at the track first. It is less than 400 yards round and is covered with hundreds of tons of cinders or similar material to make a loose and shifting surface. This enables the riders to broadside round the bends at terrific speed. The surface has to be constantly raked and leveled, for it certainly gets shifted around. And these are the machines that do the shifting. They only weigh about 200 pounds and are usually built to this particular style of each rider. The single cylinder, three and a half horsepower engine develops over 40 horsepower on the track. And this needs expert tuning and the use of a special alcohol fuel called dope. And by the way, if you're thinking of getting one for your weekend outings, they only do 10 miles per gallon, about the same as a motor bus. And they have no brakes or gearbox. They're controlled by the throttle or accelerator and the clutch. But the clutch is used only for starting. Sometimes within an inch of the other fellow's wheel. I don't know why they don't end up in a heap. The 
secret is in the art of broadsiding or the control tower slide, as demonstrated here by that spectacular rider or book. It's a combination of balance, steering, and throttle control. Let's stop them in this race so that you can see how the rider uses his left leg on which the metal ski is fitted as a third wheel on entering the bend. Weight is thrown forward to start the broadside. into the bend, he shifts his body back over the rear wheel to give maximum driving power and leans on his right footrest to keep his machine upright. Each rider has his own style, but the principle is always the same. A fall or overslide may cause a rider to crash in the path of an oncoming machine. This looks like certain death, but every rider knows the art of laying down his machine to avoid serious accidents. Let's see how it's done. No problem at all. Bill Rogers knows exactly how to do it. Like to see it again? All right, no trouble at all. You see, it is really a deliberate skid or overslide. There's not much time to think about it. Do you see what I mean about that leather suit? That you still wouldn't get me in one of those things, even as a passenger. Did I say passenger? These are sidecar outfits designed and used exclusively on Australian speedways. Rake at an angle of 30 degrees, these machines actually topple over the bands of foot. More powerful than the solo machines, they develop up to 80 horsepower on the track. They never use the saddle as the rider is always changing his position on the machine. Is that a sidecar? Well, we let them learn. Sidecar racing is absolutely terrifying when you first see it. The Frankenstein appearance of the machines and riders as they float around the track is a breathtaking spectacle. But you can't help admiring the keenness and courage of the passengers on whom so much depends. For surprisingly enough, there is method in their apparent madness. This is Jim Davies, Australian sidecar champion, and his passenger Peter Sperrin, showing how they work at the team when racing. Whoops! <laughs> yeah, that was our fault. Sorry, Jim. Let's try it again. The object of this is to show you how the balance of the machine is maintained when cornering at high speed by the application of the passenger's weight. In the straight, the passenger keeps his weight in the sidecar, streamlining himself to lessen wind resistance. Turning a right-hand bend, the centrifugal force to turn the machine over if the passenger didn't have his weight to counteract. He crouches in the sidecar down the street. Round the bend again, Peter's face nearly touching the ground. It's a great life for the passenger. They're racing again. This is a race between champions. Davies, Carruthers and Bratton have got away well. Carruthers takes the lead on the outside.
excitement of thrills and spills Britain's newest sport means for hundreds of thousands of enthusiasts in all parts of the country. In London alone, there are 200,000 members and regular supporters of the Speedway Clubs, and here at Wembley, royal fans of the Rough Riding Buccaneers number over 50,000. To them, when work is done, life is all Speedway. When we drop in, Alec Jackson, manager of the Wembley Lions, was on the phone to Alice Hart, manager of the Bellevue team of Manchester, fixing the final details of a meeting between the two clubs at Bellevue for the British Speedway Cup. Speedway meetings are big events, and this will be one of the biggest in the north, with a gate of anything up to 35,000 rip-roaring fans. Bellevue and Wembley, by the way, are two of the seven teams in the National League. The others are New Cross, Haringey, Wimbledon, West Ham, and Odsall. The bikes of the visitors are in the pits, sturdy little 500cc machines, capable of developing 40 horsepower and running on dope alcohol fuel at eight miles to the gallon. And now for the meeting, the day which thousands of club supporters and Speedway fans have been looking forward to with eager anticipation. Sometime before the first race, they begin to trickle in, as keen a bunch of followers as you'd find anywhere. Hero worshippers come to give their chosen Knights of the Wheel a good send-off. Some of the Bellevue Bells sport the club's emblem, the Ace of Clubs, on their backs. Very soon, with thousands of their fellow club members, they'll be shouting, up the aces, until they're hoarse. The huge arena begins to fill. The supporters have a sort of proud feeling that this is their show. They're part and parcel of the organization, and they've come to enjoy what they have provided. And they're going to let the world know that their team is the best ever. The track officials march to their places like guardsmen, with the club's mascot, young Roger Nicholson, bringing up the rear. That's the signal for another buzz of excitement among the packed audience, now tense with expectation as the time draws near for the start of the first race. It won't be long now. In fact, the riders are already at the starting gate, and in a moment, they'll be off. Four of the finest daredevils of the dirt track, two lions and two aces, streak off from the tapes like arrows from a bow. In the lead is Tommy Price of Wembley, British individual champion of 1946, and close behind him, Doughty Jack Parker, skipper of Bellevue. Here's a beautiful bond sign, the riders skip on the It's an all-out tussle now for the lead, but Tommy Price is holding on like the lion he is. While the band they lurch at an almost incredible angle and flash into the straight again with engines roaring in a fury of speed. There are no brakes on these demon machines. The only curb is the steel shoe on the left foot of the rider, which he uses to steady himself on the bend. It's a glad, mad lick all the way. That flag means there's one more lap to go. A moment when the riders brace themselves for the final effort, and the fans start to shut their heads off with excitement. Tommy Price is keeping up his form, and he's still in the lead as the team slither around the bend. the check flag that signals the finish, and Price has won. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, these boys are some flatterers. They fixed up a track on a London bomb site, and although their bikes are without motors, they're certainly not without speed. Just look at that nifty stuff on the bends, and their fierce acceleration on the straight. But uh, watch this. One of the customers has got loose. Mind your back there. And there's not much fun in speedway racing unless you come a cropper sometime. Now meet the team, folks. Charlie Basher, Rube the Notcher, Peter Lightning, and Bill Bedlam. As nice a lot of speedway babes as you'd meet anywhere. Up the Polecats. At Wembley Stadium offices are large index files containing the names and addresses of 50,000 club members. The young enthusiasts who support the team proudly wear its badge and attend the race meetings. 
Many of these lion cubs never miss a single match, whether at home or away. Such a large family means a great deal of correspondence, for the members take their responsibilities seriously and write in about all sorts of things. Each member has a number and a birthday, and both are duly noted in the record. There are members in all parts of the world, and news of them is given in the club's own paper. Frequent contact with its supporters strikes a personal note, which is one of the many happy features of the game. But all the correspondence is not with supporters. This morning, manager Alec Jackson receives a letter which particularly interests him. It's from a young rider who wants a trial. Alec, by the way, was a rider himself in his younger days and won over a hundred awards. So he always has a sympathetic ear to the cause of the up-and-coming rider who wants to get on. In this case, the rider is young Squire Waterman, who has won many motorcycling events while serving in the army. Waterman's mother brings him manager Jackson's reply. She feels that it must be a very important letter. It's a letter asking Waterman to call. That sounds very promising. In fact, it's just what the doctor ordered. Indeed, it's something worth going a little gay about. Waterman gives his bike a final overhaul before setting out on the great adventure. He's off to Wembley. At long last, one of his fondest dreams is coming true. He's been promised to try out with one of the most famous teams in the game. He's on his way. Imagine the feelings of the young rider as he approaches the fast stadium. He's not lacking in confidence, but that isn't everything. Passing this test will be a matter of sheer ability and a display of iron nerve common to all successful speedway riders. There's one thing that makes Waterman fancy himself. He's always been a good mechanic. He's lived with motorbikes as long as he can remember, and if he can ride half as well as he can tinker, he might stand a chance. He's got the chance anyway, and that's something most youngsters would give their ears for. So, here goes. The great adventure has begun. Youngsters are practicing on the track. That's a feature of Speedway. All the time between meetings, novices and reserves are continually practicing. Behind the scenes, promising material is being built up. Future champions make their bow to an empty arena. Waterman is now on his way to meet manager Jackson. It's a moment that he'll long remember. The genial Alec welcomes him and hands him over to Fred Williams, one of the reserves. It's Fred's job now to show him the dressing room while Alec carries on with his routine inspection. The door to the dressing room might be the threshold to stardom for a young rider whose life's ambition is to make this his career. In this room are the padded leathers, special boots and crash helmets which all speedway riders must wear. Waterman gets into his kit while other youngsters are being put through their paces on the track. in his riding rig, the new boy emerges to do his stuff. Perhaps, who knows, in that same vast arena very soon, packed crowds may be cheering a new champion. It may be that when they see what he can do, they'll... Ah, but stop that dreaming, Waterman, my lad, and let's see what you can do. Other lads have had the same idea, you know, and it stayed like that, just an idea. So just wait for it. There's a good fellow. <laughs> As Mr. Jackson says, your bike's over there. All you have to do is go to it, get on it, and ride away to fame and fortune. Ride away anyhow. Many another ambitious young rider has sat just where Waterman is sitting now. But the standard's high, and it's hard to make the grade. Waterman looks the part anyway.
He's off. The test has begun, though there's much more to come. Riding solo shows off his ability and style, but it's the teamwork that really counts. That will come later, if at all. Waterman carries on while the critical eyes of manager Jackson follow every move. Does the young man know anything about horn signing? Well, maybe himself. Keen eyes are watching Waterman's efforts in the pit, and the reaction seems pretty favorable. In fact, Alex Jackson has seen enough to satisfy himself that here might be a discovery. Good show, my boy. We'll have to get together. That pat on the back from Jackson is one of Waterman's big moments. Never was a shower more refreshing. Much of the success of champion riders is due to the skilled and painstaking maintenance of their bikes. Most riders attend to their own machines, but all the time there's a constant check by a team of expert mechanics who are as familiar with a motorbike as beef is with muscle. In the early days, the mount was a stripped road bike, then a twin-cylinder machine made for the job. Now it's a single-cylinder model, an engine and a frame weighing about 250 pounds. Regarding the engine with the eye of a connoisseur is chief mechanic Cyril Spink. What he doesn't know about motorbikes simply doesn't exist. Manager Jackson, accompanied on this occasion by George Wilkes, another member of the team, makes his daily inspection. A speedway chief is a very busy person. Not only must he be a good organizer, but a talent scout, negotiator, trainer, advisor, mechanic, and all-round practical handyman as well. He must at least know what he wants the other fellow to do. Each of these bikes costs about 200 pounds. Gearbox and gear lever are obsolete, and the frames, as far as possible, are made to suit the riders, the front forks being movable only by about an inch. The machines are made this way for better control during those wild moments when the demon riders roar around the bend. Waterman, who looks after his own mount as a hen her favorite chick, is now a member of the team, and has earned the nickname of Split because of his side-splitting antics. Split tests out his bike in the nearby car park. By careful attention and constant overhaul, he does reduce the chances of his bike letting him down. Bill Kitchen, the captain, and a star rider in his own right, is largely responsible for the coordination of the Wembley Lions as a team. By his own shining example, he keeps up its high standard of performance and nurses the reserves and the novices into championship form. Just now, he's busy on a repair to his steel shoe. This is a kind of heelless slipper which fits over the left boot and is used for steadying the rider as he takes the bend. It's his only brake. You can imagine the sort of friction the metal must stand up to during that operation. It makes the sparks fly with a vengeance. And as with their bikes, the riders prefer to service their own shoes. Each has his own little knack or fancy, and well, if you do the job yourself, you know it must be good. Bill Kitchen, by the way, was brought up on bikes, and at 18 won every race he went in for. For 13 years, he was an ace among the aces of Bellevue, won the Australian TT race in 38, and was the first holder of the match race championship. When it's hot, the rig is the worst part of the game. It consists of long leather boots with a steel shoe, leather breeches, and jacket, and a crash helmet. This, by the way, is George Wilkes. He likes to build his own machine. Bill Kitchen shows the kind of tires that are fitted to speed bikes. The rear tire is studded and barred to prevent spinning. 
Bill demonstrates the leg grip and the position of the right leg when speeding. The other leg is free to operate the steel shoe as a kind of prop on the vent. There's no kick start, and flying starts are seldom used. Usually the start takes place with engines running after a push from the pit to the line. So, good luck, Bill, and not too many spills. Is definitely a handyman. Give him a welder, and he's happy. But what's this he's welding now? Looks something like a little flag on a little mast, and by gosh it is. It's the pennant of the team. A lion rampant on a million tons of cinder. Bill must have speed, whether it's on the track, in the air, or on the water. So when he's not riding, he's sailing. One of his buddies in this life on the ocean wave is rider Roy Craighead. Captain Bill and first mate Roy rig the ship themselves. And you can't do that unless you know quite a lot about sailing and navigation. But experience counts, and they can certainly claim that they sailed before the mast, and of course, after it was put up. We caught them at Putney, getting ready to sail to foreign parts. And the whole towpath was agog as Skipper Bill and his mate heaved hull to the strains of a rollicking shanty. Just a couple of carefree sailors out on the spree, or rather, the tent. Up go the sails, and with a gentle breeze blowing in from Hammersmith, they'll soon be underway. It's a natty bit of rigging, this. A cute pattern of spars and sails and cordage. Did you ever see such a fine spanker? And there she is, fully rigged and only waiting to be launched. Ship ahoy, yoikes, and all that. Down the slip she goes, almost carried away with excitement. In a moment or two, tense moments for those who watched her being built, she'll slip gracefully into her natural element, the sea, uh, the river, and then we'll begin another glorious chapter in our maritime story. Always generous, Captain Bill Kitchen has again pushed the boat out. Launched at last. The gallant ship rides proudly on the water. All that needs to be done now is to fix the rudder. Aye, aye, sir. With the anchor weighed, the compass box, the helm ported, and the main brace spliced, the time has nearly come to shove off. And there she goes. A fine figure of a ship, if ever there was one. Bon voyage, Captain Bill. Fair winds, and give our love to whopping old stairs. In the gymnasium, Bronco Wilson at the bag, Split Waterman Skipping, and Bill Gilbert keep fit with a specially planned course of physical training. There's no more strenuous sport than speedway racing, and no rider can get anywhere near stardom unless he's absolutely fighting fit. Speedway is a game for nerves and muscles of steel, and the gym helps to keep them that way. Gathered around the medicine ball are Bill Gilbert, who joined the Lions in 46, Bronco Wilson, Bill Kitchen, captain, sometimes called the W.G. Grace of Speedway, and Split Waterman, the genial gangster. These are out on their road work. Speedway riders must have good...